Joshua chapter 3. If we turn there, we'll continue through the book of Joshua tonight as we head through the Bible as a whole on Sunday nights. The theme of Joshua, again, as we saw last week in our introduction, is possessing our possessions. Practically taking possession of the things that God has freely given us. God had freely given them the promised land. Wherever they put their foot, they needed just simply to take possession of what He had simply and freely given to them. The Lord has given us many, many promises and a rich, abundant life in Christ Jesus. It's all ours. It's already been given to us in Christ Jesus. And now the issue is how much you and I are going to individually as Christians take possession of that. Uh, some people, is, if you've been around the body of Christ any length of time, you understand that some people possess about one square inch of it. And uh, they'll get into heaven uh, as by fire. A little a singe of smoke on them, their hair slightly burned. and uh, But saved, God loves them, they're going to heaven, all of that. Uh, but they'll have missed the entirety of what God has for His children this side of glory. Others are just determined with everything they have to fully explore uh, God's promises to them in the Word of God. And this book is an encouragement to do that. The possessing of the promises of God, the possessing of the promised land, was going to be accomplished by simply obeying God's Word. Uh, they weren't going to have to have their Ph.D. in theology. They weren't going to have uh, to be able to run, um, you know, a, a two-hour marathon. They weren't going to have to have any kind of special or particular talent to be able to uh, enjoy the fullness of life that God has for each of His children. None of that. All they needed to do all we need to do is simply obey God's Word. And in the course of that obedience, we take possession of the promises that He has for us, of the rich, full, abundant life, as Jesus described it, that is there for us. And as we obey, we discover that it is everything that He said it would be. In chapter 3, God is going to nurture the faith of these people. You remember that when he brought the children of Israel out of Egypt, at the very beginning, that first generation, uh, he didn't race them uh, up to the promised land. Uh, he could have, but he didn't. He took some time to develop a relationship with them. They knew about him. They knew about his involvement with Abraham and Isaac, and Jacob, but they didn't have a personal relationship with him. That personalness, that kind of a relationship had occurred 400 years earlier. So they knew he existed. They knew that he was their God. They worshipped him in their own way there in Egypt. But in terms of a personal relationship, a personal understanding of who he is, how he works, and that he is utterly trustworthy, they didn't have it. Not by a, a knowledge, by experience. They had it in the noggin, perhaps, but not by experience. And God took that first generation and he spent some time with them, the performing of miracles, the speaking to them, the declaring of his truth to them, in order to develop a relationship with them. And that's what he's going to do here with the children of Israel now as they get ready to pro enter into the promised land. He's going to develop their faith. He's going to nurture their faith. You know, the Lord is working in our lives today, uh, not just with today in mind. He, he works in our lives today with tomorrow in mind, and next week in mind, and next year in mind, if He should tarry. He knows what tomorrow is going to bring. And he knows that we're going to need to be prepared for tomorrow. We're going to need character for tomorrow. We're going to need character for tomorrow's ministry. We're going to need maturity 
for the faith that will be required of us tomorrow and the next day. And here is a group of people who are not ready for Jericho. You take this group of people in the condition that they're in, and you bring them right up to the gates of Jericho, and they'll flip. It's too much for them. The Lord knows it's too much for them. So he's going to develop their faith because he knows that a Jericho is in their future, and he's going to want them prepared for it. He works the same way in our lives. He's always preparing us. Always preparing us for what it is that he knows is going to come down the pipe. Then Joshua rose early in the morning following the favorable report of the spies who returned back from uh, Jericho. And they set out from Acacia Grove and came to the Jordan, he and all the children of Israel, and they lodged there before they crossed over. And so it was after three days that the officers went through the camp. So God brings the children of Israel this camping trip of two and a half million people and he brings them right to the edge of the Jordan River and he camps them there. And he camps them there for three days. And for three days they're forced to look out of the openings of their tents and look out on this Jordan River. We're going to see a little bit later on in the chapter that the Jordan River is swollen at this time. It's the time in which the river overflowed its banks during the whole time of the harvest, we're told in verse 15. And so they're looking at this river, and the river is flooded. And the river is widening and narrowing and widening and narrowing in terms of how you would go down the river. And it would go from... Uh, uh, anywhere from being 200 yards in width to a mile in width, and it's all along the banks. You know, you go over there to the Jordan River now, and it's, you know, nicely trimmed back. We've heavily developed, you know, so much of the world. But in that day, just overgrown with all kinds of brush, all kinds of bushes, and the depth of the river would be about 12 feet deep, current just moving very, very powerfully. Very, very strong. The Lord plunks them down in front of that river. And in essence, he is communicating to them, take a nice, long, good, hard look at that river. And look at the impossibility of you ever crossing that river on your own. Ten of you, let alone two and a half million of you. Just take a look at the impossibility of the situation. You ever had the Lord do that thing? He shows you the impossibility of the situation and you say, and you spot it. I mean, immediately, within five seconds, you, you, you are, are quite aware of the fact that it's impossible. And then, but then he camps you there for three days because he knows us. He knows we're slow learners. And he knows that he really needs to drive home the point. You can look at that Say, what a cruel God camps the people there for three days in front of that river just to torture them, just to make them wail and lament all through the night. Sometimes you can feel that way about trials that he brings into our lives. Oh, he's brought it in just to torture me, just to be cruel to me. But he didn't do it for that reason. He did it to develop their faith. Real, true faith in his children. And in order to develop real, true faith, not theoretical faith, not what we think is faith because we've read 50 books on faith or heard 50 sermons on faith, but real faith, it requires being put in impossible situations. And when you really stop to think about it, we're very rarely asked to walk completely by faith. Usually it's 20% faith, 80% sight. You see how that can work out. Yeah, I can see how that could move and then check and then you move the horse and the pawn and over here and then it's checking. And it's, and it's, okay, I see how God could do that. But it's not that often that the Lord forces us just to walk completely by faith. We have misconceptions about faith. We think it's a 20% thing. 
but he's going to ha- ask them to walk completely by faith, and he'll ask us to do the same thing. All in preparation for Jericho. They're not ready for it. He's preparing them for it. And so he says, as they camped there, the officers went through the camp and they commanded the people saying, when you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God and the priests, the Levites, bearing it, when you set, then you shall set out from your place and go after it. And yet there shall be a space between you and it about 2,000 cubits by measure. Do not come near it, speaking of the Ark of the Covenant, that you may know the way by which you must go, for you have not passed this way before. So there was to be a distance of 3,000 feet between the Ark of the Covenant and the people. They weren't to follow the Ark of the Covenant too closely. They were to give it to some distance. Well, you can imagine two and a half million people, how broad they would be lined up there on the Jordan River, And if the Ark of the Covenant was just 10 feet out in front of them, very few of them could see the Ark of the Covenant. So he puts it way, way out, the Ark of the Covenant way out, so that everyone could see the Ark of the Covenant, which represented the presence of God, and see the direction that God was going in so that they could then follow after God. So they were to follow after God, but there was to be some distance. They weren't supposed to push God. And Joshua said to the people, Sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. It's interesting that he doesn't cry out to them and say, Now, listen, I want you to check your arrows and check your spears and make sure that your swords are sharpened and let's make sure that we've got everything just the way that we need it, you know, in order to win this battle. He understands that the greatest need as it relates to the battle is that they be sanctified that their lives be set apart unto God. Because you can have the greatest tools, have the greatest weaponry, the greatest everything, and if my life isn't sanctified, then it isn't going to allow God to do what He wants to do. It's not going to produce victory. Before this confrontation, there has to be purification. And so the importance here of sanctify yourself If they didn't sanctify themselves, there would be no Jericho. They'd never even get to Jericho. A lot of people never even get to Jericho because they're unwilling to allow the Holy Spirit to cleanse their life. And then Joshua spoke to the priests saying, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and cross over before the people. So they took up the Ark of the Covenant and went before the people. And the Lord said to Joshua, This day I will begin to magnify you in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. And you shall command the priests who bear the Ark of the Covenant, saying, When you have come to the edge of the water of the Jordan, you shall stand in the Jordan. And so we see Ark of the Covenant, Ark of the Covenant, the Ark, the Ark, the Ark, the Ark, the Ark of the Covenant, repeated about 17 times in these two chapters. And the point that God is making is that the key to the victory is His presence. It's His presence. They were to follow Him in His presence. And then Joshua said to the children of Israel, Come here and hear the words of the Lord your God. And Joshua said, By this you shall know that the living God is among you, and that he will without fail drive out from before you the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, the Girgashites, and the Amorites, and the Jebusites. All of those ites, they were driven out. The miracle that God is about to do in their lives had a twofold purpose. The twofold purpose was that they would know that the living God is among them. And we need to know that, don't we? It makes all the difference in the world, doesn't it? In terms of the things that we run into in our life. But it was also to produce within them a confidence that without fail, God would drive out all of these other nations before them, all of their enemies before them. He said, Behold the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of all of the earth is crossing over before you into the Jordan. And now, therefore, take for yourselves 
twelve men from the tribes of Israel, one man from every tribe, and it shall come to pass as soon as the soles of the feet of the priests who bear the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all of the earth, shall rest in the waters of the Jordan, that the waters of the Jordan shall be cut off, the water that uh, the waters that come down from upstream, and they shall stand as a heap. And so here God says the priests to take the Ark of the Covenant, they're to go ahead and not, you know, raise a wave a wand over the river. Okay, Lord? Go. So he's going to make them step into the river. Oh boy, I'm going to step into the river. This has the potential of me looking stupid or foolish if God doesn't come through. I look stupid or foolish anyway. So you know, make any difference. But it's interesting here that God is not going to part this river, Jordan, until they put their feet in the water. Just right there. That getting wet kind of faith that's required. Taking that step and God coming through in the last second. And again, there's that potential of looking foolish, but God's going to come through. And this is how He wanted it to be. Speaking to us in the New Testament, just communicating. In, in, in essence, we need to get our feet wet as it relates to the promises of God. Go ahead and jump into one of them. And get your feet wet in one of them. Go ahead and stand on one of them. Just don't wait for it to turn into something and be something from this side of it. Jump into it. Get your feet wet and you'll discover it to be exactly what I said it would be. It relates to all of His promises. It's interesting here because this crossing over of the Jordan River that they're about to do has a New Testament typology. And it's a type really of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They've come out of Egypt. They've come out of the world. They've already passed through the Red Sea, which Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians is a picture of water baptism. They've been out there in the wilderness for 40 years, but they're still in the wilderness after 40 years. Saved? Absolutely. Baptized? Yes, absolutely. Water baptized? No longer in Egypt? Yes, no longer in Egypt but still not quite in Canaan either. Not quite in the abundant life either. And their life is its a bone-dry kind of Christianity. And wandering in the wilderness. They're not out of the wilderness yet. And yet they're in that place where they look across that river into the promised land. And as they look at it, it's everything that God said it would be. But they're still on this side of the river. There's this huge gulf that stands between where they're at and then all of the fullness of what God has described and, and, and what it is that is there. Big difference between the promise and what they're experiencing. They see it. They want it. They long for it. But there's one thing that stands between them and the promised land. Between them and that land that God had promised to them, and that was the Jordan River. And it's a picture of the fact that for many Christians, there stands between them and the abundant life an experience with a river too. And it is the river of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus spoke concerning the baptism of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. And He said, But when you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And then in John chapter 7, Jesus likens that overflow of the Holy Spirit, that baptism of the Holy Spirit, that fullness of the Holy Spirit, having the Holy Spirit flow out of my innermost being as torrents of living water, as rivers of living water. And so, it's a picture, in my mind, of, of water baptism here. That experience with a river that they need. They're God's people. But they need this work of God in order to 
move on into what it is that God has for them. And it's interesting that quite a few years later, it would be a different Joshua, Jesus, who would stand in that very spot that they're standing at right here in, by the Jordan River. In that very same spot, John the Baptist would baptize him there. And then in that baptism, that water baptism, the Holy Spirit would come upon Jesus like a dove, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and he would begin his public ministry right there in the same spot. And so it was, verse 14, when the people set out from their camp to cross over the Jordan with the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant before the people, and as those who bore the Ark came to the Jordan, and the feet of the priests who bore the Ark dipped in the edge of the water, for the Jordan overflows all its banks during the whole time of harvest, that the waters which came down from upstream stood still and rose up in a heap very far away at Adam, which is six miles upstream, the city that is beside Zaratan. And so the waters that went down, uh, the waters that went down into the sea of Arabah, the salt sea, failed and were cut off. And the people crossed over opposite Jericho. And then the priests who bore the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the midst of the Jordan. And all Israel crossed over on dry ground until all the people had crossed completely over the Jordan. And so they cross over into the Jordan River. They've had the experience with this river now. And the effect of that experience of the Jordan River was to confirm in their hearts that the living God was with them and that God would be faithful to drive out their enemies. It's the same thing that the baptism or the fullness of the work of the Holy Spirit produces in a person's life. When a person is baptized with the Holy Spirit, given that power to be a witness unto Jesus in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth, no matter where God would take us, the power to be a witness. One of the great things about the baptism of the Holy Spirit and that work of God's Holy Spirit is what happens in our life. Of course, it's going to impact other lives, but the impact that it has on our lives And one of the great impacts that it has is it confirms. We know of a surety that the living God is in us. He's among us. And it gives us the confidence that He is not only with us, He is not only in me, He is not only upon me, but He will be faithful now to drive out my enemies. And my enemies are not the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Perizzites. My enemies are the sins within my life that have dominated my life before coming to know the Lord. And now, as I step out in God's promises, God will be faithful to drive those things out of my life. It provides a testimony to a risen Lord. Chapter 4. And it came to pass when all the people had completely crossed over the Jordan that the Lord spoke to Joshua, saying, Take for yourselves twelve men from the people, one man from every tribe, And command them, saying, Take for yourselves twelve stones from here out of the midst of the Jordan, from the place where the priests' feet stood firm. And you shall carry them over with you and leave them in the lodging place where you lodge tonight. Then Joshua called the twelve men whom he had appointed from the children of Israel, one man from every tribe. And Joshua said to them, Cross over before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of the Jordan, And each one of you take up a stone on his shoulder according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel. That this may be a sign among you when your children ask. Here is the Lord's concern for the children. And that the truths of God and the miracles of God and the great works of God be passed on to the next generation. And he gives the parents an opportunity to do that. So when the children ask in time to some come saying, what do these stones mean to you? What does this all mean to you? Then you shall answer them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord when it crossed over before the Jordan. The waters of the Jordan were cut off 
And these stones shall be for a memorial to the children of Israel forever. And so God establishes a memorial for His miracle of them crossing the Jordan River. He wants to permanently drive home the truth of this particular miracle. Getting across the river isn't enough. Having God perform the miraculous isn't enough. God wants His miracles to be remembered. And one of the great enemies to your faith and to my faith is this forgettery that is right here. How much we forget and how completely we can forget. And so we find ourselves continually in these places where the Lord is telling us to take a step of faith and because we have forgotten about how faithful He's been all the way along, it's like we're taking this first step all over again instead of looking and saying, ha, ah, this is a cinch compared to all of this back here and going ahead and stepping out on it. But we forget. And it's a very great danger to our faith. And God understands that. And so He wants them to remember His miracles. I mean, He didn't bring them across the Jordan every day. It's a miracle that He shares His air and His food. and his, He's doing the miraculous every day. But He didn't do the miraculous on that kind of a level every day. And so it was to be remembered. It's interesting that this first memorial that's set up, it tells us in verse 8, that the children of Israel did so just as Joshua commanded and took up twelve stones from the midst of the Jordan. From the midst. They took it out of the Jordan as the Lord had spoken to Joshua according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel and carried them over with them to the place where they lodged, which is Gilgal, and laid them down there. So they build two memorials. This is the first one. And the first one is they take the stones out of the middle of the river and they bring it onto dry land. The first memorial that God calls them to set up was to be a public memorial. A memorial that everyone could see. The second memorial he talks to us about in verse 9. And then Joshua set up twelve stones in the midst of the Jordan. He didn't bring them out of the Jordan. He set up twelve stones in the midst of the Jordan before it headed back to its, its normal flow in the place where the feet of the priests who bore the Ark of the Covenant stood and they are there to this day. You just have a little trouble identifying them. And so here is the second memorial and it is set up right in the middle of the Jordan River And then God is going to command the river to resume its course and that memorial is going to be hidden by the stream of the Jordan River. One public, one private. Both of them memorials of the same experience. Same truth. The same miracle of God. It's interesting that when we get into the New Testament that God has given us as the body of Christ Two ordinances. There are only two ordinances that we see in the Gospels, we see practiced in the book of Acts, and we see taught in the epistles. And the two ordinances that we're commanded to partake of as Christians is water baptism and the Lord's Supper or communion. And water baptism is a public memorial. It is an outward expression of an inward reality. It is an expression on the part of a Christian to all of the world that I have decided to align myself with Jesus Christ. I was once dead in my sins, represented by the watery grave, the pool, or whatever you get baptized in. And God has raised me up out of that death into resurrection life. And so water baptism, that outward memorial, that proclamation, speaking of the 
thanksgiving, the remembering of the salvation that God has freely given to me. And then there's the Lord's Supper, a private memorial where God's people gather to partake of the bread and the wine, the bread and the cup, the symbol of Jesus' body and His blood. And that's not public. That's only for the Christians. It's private. It occurs between individuals and God. But both of them look back on the same miracle of salvation, spiritual birth. God wants us as Christians to always be in awe of His salvation. That He has saved me. That He's overwhelmed my past with His grace. That He's overwhelmed my present with His grace, and He's overwhelmed my future with His grace. They were never to lose sight of it. They were never to forget it. And God has established it for us, that remembrance of the fact that God saved me. We get all complicated in our Christianity at times. All of the different defining and redefining and all of this and all of that and stuff. But Christianity is really just about that. Where the Lord has saved us. He saved us and called us into relationship with Him. I hope we're still as in awe of it today as we were before. As we think about it. It's really tremendous. And so Joshua sets up that twelve stones in the midst of the Jordan and then we're told in verse 10, So the priests who bore the ark stood in the midst of the Jordan until everything was finished that the Lord had commanded Joshua to speak to the people according to all that Moses had commanded Joshua. And the people hastened and crossed over. I don't know. You know, they moved pretty quickly. Uh, You might be do that too if you see the river, you know. And then it came to pass when all the people had completely crossed over that the ark of the Lord and the priests crossed over in the presence of the people. And the men of Reuben and the men of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh crossed there over armed before the children of Israel as Moses had spoken to them. About 40,000 prepared for war crossed over before the Lord uh, for battle to the plains of Jericho. And on that day, the Lord magnified Joshua in the sight of all of Israel and they feared him as they had feared Moses all the days of his life. And God put a stamp of approval and said, "Uh, this is the man, you know, that I'm going to be talking to and giving orders to. And they said, yeah, we got you loud and clear. It's a lot like Moses. And then the Lord spoke to Joshua saying, command the priest to bring the ark of the testimony to come up from the Jordan. And Joshua therefore commanded the priest saying, Come up from the Jordan. I think it's interesting to note there in verse 15 that the Lord spoke to Joshua. He didn't speak to all two and a half million. He didn't speak to all of the elders. He didn't speak to all of the priests. He spoke to one man. There are times when he speaks to a broader group of people. But there are also times when he speaks to just one man. And a leader has to be free to hear the Lord and to move out as it relates to what God has called him to do. He's to be a servant. He's to be a servant leader. But there needs to be the understanding among God's people that there will be times when He will take an individual man and give him instructions and that man is to do what God has told him to do. And he is to impart that vision then to the people. And we're going to see him give some very wild instructions to Joshua as it relates to taking the city of Jericho. And I dare say that the instructions that he gives to to Joshua concerning the taking of the city of Jericho, that it would have never survived a church committee meeting. Would have never made it. And that's one of the great dangers is 
for assemblies of God's people that very easily become old wineskins. Until everything has to be filtered so thoroughly through this and that and every manner of person and even every manner of carnal person. Until the Lord just looks at it and said, there is no way that I could get that group of people to even consider taking on a Jericho, let alone taking it on. And so he abandons it. He moves from it and he finds another man and he raises up another man and then he gives the same vision to other people who then when they hear the vision from this man come alongside and then they're willing to follow this man and be in his being led of the Lord into what it is that God is telling him to do. Sometimes it works that way. I think it's a foolish leader who doesn't take the counsel of people that are around him and listen to them, pray about what they have to say. But it is interesting to note that you see God raising up one man and He does it continually all through the Old Testament and even on into the New Testament. Paul was nobody's choice but God's. So he tells the priests, come up from the Jordan, verse 17. They came to pass when the priests who bore the ark of the covenant of the Lord had come from the midst of the Jordan and the soles of the priests' feet touched the dry land that the waters of the Jordan returned to their place and flowed over all its banks as before. Now the people came up from the Jordan on the tenth day of the first month and they camped in Gilgal on the east border of Jericho. And those twelve stones which they took out of the Jordan, Joshua set up in Gilgal. And then he spoke to the children of Israel saying, When your children ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What are these stones? Then you shall let your children know, saying, Israel crossed over the Jordan on dry land. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan before you until they had crossed over as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which He dried up before us until we had crossed over, that the peoples of the earth might know the hand of the Lord, that it is mighty. And number two, that you may fear the Lord your God forever. And so it was when all the kings of the Amorites who were on the west side of the Jordan and all of the kings of the Canaanites who were by the sea heard that the Lord had dried up the waters of the Jordan from before the children of Israel until we had crossed over that their heart melted and there was no spirit in them any longer because of the children of Israel. That would flip you out, wouldn't it? Be kind of a heavy thing to watch. Got your binoculars out. Up on the wall there in Jericho. You're not going to believe this. God has blocked off the Jordan River up at the city of Adam. And two and a half million people have crossed without getting their feet wet. Only the priests got their feet wet. What do you think that would do to your heart if you, you know, were the next course? (laughs) It would put fear in your heart. But interestingly enough, they wouldn't be so fearful that they'd be willing to repent. And so here is this fear that they're in. And whenever God's people are filled with the Holy Spirit under the control of the Holy Spirit. Another way of saying it. Obeying God despite the circumstances. Walking by faith. You can be sure that the enemies of God are living in fear. And that's the condition that they were in. And at that time, while the enemies of God are living in fear, God said, listen, this is our chance Let's go after them and crush them. Let's beat them, bust them. That's our custom. It's our perfect chance now to to wipe them out, to attack them, to charge them. That's not what he says. At that time, the Lord said to Joshua, make flint knives for yourself and circumcise the sons of Israel again 
the second time. And so Joshua made flint knives for himself and circumcised the sons of Israel. This is two and a half billion people at the hill of the foreskins. And this is the reason why Joshua circumcised them. All of the people who came out of Egypt who were males, all the men of war had died in the wilderness on the way after they had come out of Egypt. For all the people who came out had been circumcised, but all the people who were born in the wilderness on the way as they came out of Egypt had not been circumcised. For the children of Israel walked 40 years in the wilderness till all the people who were men of war who came out of Egypt were consumed because they did not obey the voice of the Lord, though physically circumcised. didn't affect their heart. To whom the Lord swore that he would not show them the land which the Lord had shown to their fathers that he would give us a land flowing with milk and honey. And so Joshua circumcised their sons whom he raised up in their place for they were uncircumcised because they had not been circumcised on the way. And so it was when they had finished circumcising all of the people that they stayed in their place in the camp till they were healed. Yes, that goes without saying. So there's some kooky things that are kind of going on here in this whole thing. And the reason for circumcision to begin with, it was a covenant that God had made with Abraham. And it was to be a mark that a person was in a covenant relationship with God. And the cutting away of the foreskin was to represent the cutting away of the flesh. It was to be a mark that they were no longer like everybody else in the world. Now, in the New Testament, we're told that the Holy Spirit performs a circumcision on our hearts. He cuts away the flesh off of our hearts. And that's an ongoing thing uh, uh, that He does in our lives. It's an ongoing, glorious work that He does. And so, they hadn't been circumcised. It was a symbol of that covenant. And God wanted them circumcised before they engaged themselves in battle there with uh, Jericho. Now, his timing is weird. Now, in my humble opinion, if you're going to circumcise your whole army, and we remember in Genesis that when the sons of Shechem were circumcised, that Reuben and Levi went into the city and They slew the whole city. Two guys slew an entire city because they were disabled due to circumcision. So it makes you quite vulnerable. If you're going to circumcise your entire army and all of the people, don't you think it would make sense to do it on the other side of the Jordan? And then at least you have the Jordan River between you. So that if they mount a preemptive attack, your wife and kids could lift you up and carry you some distance away. I mean, you'd have some chance of defending yourself. But no, that's not what God does. God brings them across the Jordan River, puts them in an absolutely vulnerable position, and then proceeds to circumcise them. Crazy strategy. but not crazy for what He's doing. Because what He's doing is again carefully developing their faith and teaching them that even though this looks wild, even though this doesn't look very wise, I've told you to do it. And if you obey My Word, I'll take care of you. And that's what He's doing. That's what He did. the children of Israel camped in Gilgal and kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month at twilight on the plains of Jericho. So they keep the Passover and they ate of the produce of the land. (laughs) No more manna! All right! Done with that manna. Forty years of manna. Manna in the morning, manna in the...
Now they get into the land of promise and they eat the produce of the land. And imagine the sounds. On the day after the Passover, unleavened bread and parched grain on the same day. Now the manna ceased on the day after they had eaten the produce of the land. And the children of Israel no longer had manna, but they ate the food of the land of Canaan that year. So they now move out of the wilderness because they've moved now into the promised land. There's no need for God to provide for them through manna. There's no need for the miraculous provision through manna. God is providing through the food that He has placed before them in the land. It's still His provision. But now He's going to provide for them through ordinary means. And so when it is necessary for Him to provide through obviously miraculous means, He does that. But when it's not necessary, then He provides for them just in what would appear to be the natural course of things. And it came to pass, when Joshua was by Jericho, that he lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, a man stood opposite him. What's Joshua doing over by Jericho? Joshua's an old soldier. He's an old general. He's a military man. He's got the binoculars out. So let's see. If we hit the place with ladders right there, they'll probably pour boiling oil on us, so I don't want to do that. Looks like we can stop up their water supply over here, and then maybe we could trench under, come up underneath the city. Maybe we could get some hot air balloons, go over the top, something like that. I don't doubt that he's trying to figure out how to take this city. And it's a pretty big city. In fact, the city of Jericho had walls that were 30 feet high and 12 feet thick. That's a pretty big wall, isn't it? Inside are fierce, fierce soldiers. You know, sinners can be pretty fierce. Joshua's probably thinking, what do we do? God, what are the walls here? Can we do some battering ram stuff? Something like that. And he's thinking, he's trying to formulate maybe his own plan on how he's going to take that city, you know, and all of this. And as, as he's trying to figure all of this out, this guy shows up. He doesn't even notice him until he turns around and sees him. A man stood opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand. Ooh, sounds like trouble. And the Lord and Joshua went to him and said to him, are you for us or for our adversaries? Because, you know, there's only two choices. Are you for me? Or are you for them? Yeah, we go to God with two choices all of the time, don't we? And then this man said, No. Which I think is classic. No. I didn't give you a yes or no question. I said, are you for us or for them? The answer would be us or them. And this guy says, no. But as the commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth. That hurts. And worshipped and said to him, What does my Lord say to his servant? This can be no one other than the person of Jesus Christ in a Christophany. A pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus in the Old Testament. Because if it were a mere angel, the angel would not receive the worship. You remember in Revelation when the John finds himself falling down before the angel and worshiping him because he's overwhelmed by the whole scene. The angel just like 
he, you know, he's, he's a little anxious about it. Get up, get up. Doing that around here. We're in heaven. You can't be worshiping me up here in heaven. Get up. I'm just like you. I'm a creation. Don't do that. And I'm just falling down like the scarecrow and the Wizard of Oz. <laughs> Much like we'll be without a new body. So he says, listen, up here and around this whole scene, nobody worships anybody but God. Don't be worshiping me. And an angel won't accept that worship. A fallen angel would, but not a real angel. Not one that has stayed with its first estate. And so here is... This one who receives the worship, he must be God. So the question is, are you for us or for our adversaries? The angel of the Lord here, the commander of the army of the Lord says, in effect, I'm for God. (laughs) And the question is, are you for me or not for me? That's the question. And it's interesting to me that the victory at Jericho begins right here in this chapter. That's where it begins. It begins with Joshua yielding control over to the Lord. God is going to establish between he and Joshua before they move even one step forward who it is that's in charge. He's going to reconfirm here to Joshua. Joshua You are at best number two. You will never be number one. I am number one. And you must depend upon me. And the victory that's going to follow is a victory that's going to follow out of Joshua's worship here of God and of Jesus being the Lord of his life and the Lord of his situations and of him being a servant of this commander of the army of the Lord. That's where victory comes out of. Jesus being the Lord. God being the Lord of my life. Me being His servant. Not me saying, listen, do you notice I think we found a chink in the armor up there? I see a bad mortar job there on the west side. What do you say? Shall we hit it, you know? Run about a hundred men on that side? Then bring a, you know, a million people around the backside and whip them from over there. What do you think? God, just look at us and, who do you think you are? That's the most pathetic plan I've ever heard. That's not going to work and that's not my plan at all. We come to the Lord with all these plans. I hate the church growth movement. All of the ways to grow the church apart from God. I hate it. It will limit the growth of the church, the true growth of the church. Us foisting our plans on Him. Since when wasn't it good enough just to pray, to fall on our face and say, You're the Lord. It's your church. What do you have in mind? What are you going to do? What do you want to do? And I'm your servant. I'll do whatever you say. He can never give the battle plan of a Jericho to someone with a lesser heart than that. Because they'll never do it. Never be willing to do it. And so here Jesus establishes these things in His Life. I am in control, Joshua, not you. Now Joshua finds that place. It's a characteristic of his life over and over again. He's spoken of as the servant of the Lord, and that's why his life was so fruitful. He was the servant. I'm not here to tell you what to do, Lord. I'm not here to boss you. I'm not here to foist my plans on you and then ask you to bless them. I'm not here for any of that. I'm here to just hear what you want to do, what it is that you've got in your mind, and then I'll be your servant and move out and do that. I'll remain dependent upon you, and I'll obey you. That dependence and that obedience is critical for victory today. We search our lives. Am I dependent on the Lord? Really dependent on the Lord.
our ministries really dependent on the Lord? I mean, really dependent on the Lord. I have a confidence as it relates to this fellowship that if we were to move away from a dependence on the Holy Spirit, it would collapse in two weeks because we're not talented enough to pretend And the people who are talented enough are too tired to pretend. They've already been there and done that. And it's so wonderful to be in that place of dependence on the Lord. I remember when we first started the church here in town. I had come from another church and there were some difficulties that happened afterwards And everything that I was going to do that had been modeled for me in the other church that I was going to make the model for a ministry here, I saw going up in smoke in another city. It's a terrible thing to have quit your job and sold your home and moved your family over to this city and you watch what you were going to do over here go up in smoke. And not only that, but it's winter. Fog setting in. I would walk every day at fog. Saturdays, oh God, give me a text, give me a text, God, give me a text. Give life to something in your word so I can teach your word tomorrow. Oh Lord, please, please, <laughs> please. And I was so wiped out because now I've not only in the middle of this new work starting, but now I'm not even sure what's of the Lord and what's right in terms of ministry. And I'm and I'm going back to the Word of God and trying to redefine what is ministry and what is a pastor supposed to be like and what is a ministry supposed to look like and what are elders supposed to be like and deacons supposed to be like and home fellowship leaders supposed to be like. What is all of this? And having to do all of that and to realize, Lord, I'm over here now and I don't know anything and I thought I knew something. Didn't think I knew much, but I thought I knew something. But on those Saturday nights, I'd stay up writing and writing and writing and writing. Two in the morning, three in the morning. I'd give up, Lord, I'm going to bed. And I'd go to bed and then wake up with three hours sleep or something and get ready to head down to the church. It seems so cruel to me. Gosh, Lord, it's nothing for you to give life to your word. Just three points, just three points, just three points out of a sermon. And I remember one time we went ice skating one night on a Saturday night. Crazy. That was my agony night. I needed every minute till 3 o'clock to put something together. And I went ice skating. And I'm out there ice skating. And I, I can handle the heat. I love the heat. Well, I... <laughs> I can handle the heat. The heat is nice. It's okay. But the cold, and we've ice skated for about an hour, and then they put us up in the stands. We're all sweaty from ice skating. They put us in the stands and give us this half-hour demonstration of the ice capades or something over there in Stockton or some kind of a thing. And then it got, I got absolutely freezing cold. And then I got the chills, and I fell, and I ruined my hip. And now I'm dragging my right leg home, you know, and I got the chills and a fever, the whole thing, and I don't have a single thing to say the next morning. And I get home and I can't even keep my eyes open. And I go to bed. I have nothing to say to the people the next morning. I have nothing to say. God, why are you doing this to me? 
why are you doing this to me? This is cruel. Kill me now. Kill me now, Lord. Hi, Pacific Bell. Can I have my job back, please? Let me have my job back, please. I'll give back my early retirement money. I got it all right here. I'll give it back to you. I'll work like you've never had anyone work for you before. You didn't give me my job back. I got up in that pulpit and I did not have a single thing to say that morning. Seriously. Not a single thing to say. And I just shared about salvation and closed up the Bible and went home and quit again in my mind. And we can look back and laugh at it now. But it was torture then. I mean, week in and week out, torture. But he was driving home a point. The dependence upon him for fruit. And if I ever have an inkling to get haughty or to get this or that, all he needs to do is flash for a moment the feeling that one has at 2.30 in the morning on a Saturday night looking through a book that is currently dead to them as it relates to sermon material. And all of a sudden, I remember, it's a work of your spirit, Lord. I've got to stay dependent upon you. Lord, what I was back then, and you drove that lesson home deep into my heart, What I was then, I am still today apart from Your grace and the work of Your Spirit. The importance of staying dependent upon the Holy Spirit in our ministries and in our walk with Him. It seems like a hard lesson, so much of this, as He's developing their faith. But He knows that they'll need it later on. And he knows that we will need it later on also.